Tibetan painting is primarily religious and draws on the rich reservoir of Buddhist tradition from the 8th century onwards. The colours are deep and varied, the works careful and intricate in nature. They reflect Tibet's rich cultural and historical heritage. Subject matter ranges from the compassionate goddesses to the terrifying guardian figures. Many of these works come from Dr. Huang Quang Ho of Seoul in Korea. He is a well-known collector in Korea and also an enthusiastic supporter of the British Museum. Some of these exhibits will tour other museums across Europe, but for the time being, it is the British Museum that is privileged to house such works. A house is not just a home in Mongolia. It is a symbol of a way of life. At one time, the majority of Mongolia's nomads lived in gurs or tents as they wandered the steppes. But times are changing. Over the past few years, tens of thousands of nomads have been forced by poverty to head to the cities in search of work, creating a new population deprived of proper housing and social benefits. These nomads can't afford the fancy apartments springing up in Mongolia. So instead, they've settled on an updated version of the GUR. Cheap, environmentally friendly homes which help impoverished families save on energy bills during Mongolia's bitter winters. The United Nations Development Program has helped finance the housing scheme as Mongolia battles rising poverty. While it's a small step, these new homes are helping poor nomads cope with the transition to a new way of life. Over the past 14 years, the population of Ulan Bator has increased from 555,200 registered residents to 820,000. During the same period, many people have lost their jobs as state-owned industries have been privatized or closed. Russians are celebrating the holiday of Maslenitsa, a pre-Christian festival marking the end of winter and the return of sunny days. Maslenitsa was not officially observed during the Soviet years, but has made a popular revival across the country. The ancient city of Suzdal, about 200 kilometers northeast of Moscow, hosted large-scale celebrations featuring traditional music and contests such as climbing up a slippery pole. Maslenitsa is the Russian equivalent of Brazilian Carnival, though the freezing temperatures mean that the dancers show a lot less flesh Geese were also brought out for traditional fights. Trained and prepared, their fighting instincts are sharpened by the coming of spring and mating urges. But for people, the holiday is supposed to be more peaceful. For the church calendar, Maslenitsa marks the last festive days before Lent, the period of fasting and prayer leading up to Easter holidays. Organizers walk through the crowd calling out traditional phrases to love and forgive one another. By tradition, Russians use the Maslenista holiday as a chance to ask forgiveness of one another for any offenses over the past year. Past problems and long grey winter days 
are symbolically burned away at the end of the holiday as people set fire to a winter scarecrow and prepare to welcome springtime. Filipinos flocked to theatres to get their first preview of the documentary Imelda after a court ruled against the former First Lady's attempt to block the showing. Moviegoers were anxious to learn more about the complex woman who retains a strong grip on the country's psyche. The documentary by Filipino-American filmmaker Ramona Diaz has been highly touted in the Western press winning the Best Cinematography Award at the Sundance Film Festival. However, Mrs. Marcos sought an injunction to prevent its release in the Philippines, tearfully proclaiming in court that the film makes a joke of her life. Despite Imelda's fears that the film makes her look like a cheap flirt, flirting with all the men of the world, Filipinos of all ages seemed more than willing to watch the movie with an open mind. The film charts Mrs. Marcos's rise from a provincial beauty queen to a high-powered first lady whose singing parties and 3,000 pairs of shoes have become legendary. Diaz has been adamant with her claims that the film is a balanced portrayal of Imelda, told mostly through her own words. Those who saw the film seem to agree with the filmmaker's assertions. Some Filipinos who lived through Imelda's years in power were not so kind with their reactions to the film and its controversial subject. The film will be a huge success in the Philippines. It is easy to be beautiful because it is natural. Look, at this age and stage, I feel so good, I'm still ready to fly. Tickets for evening shows sold out hours in advance, indicating the Filipino public's eagerness to view the long-awaited documentary. Britain's Asian community is arguably its most established ethnic group. Since first arriving on British shores in the 1600s, they have worked hard to build successful lives for themselves in the UK. Their annual disposable income, known now as the Brown Pound, was estimated by a census in the year 2001 to be around 32 billion pounds and rising. This show attracted exhibitors from backgrounds as diverse as catering, fashion and entertainment and they're all keen to make one-on-one -on -one contact with existing and potential customers. The show organisers say will be an annual event and they want to welcome all Britons, whatever their background, to join them in celebrating all that the Asian lifestyle has to offer. This exhibition in London celebrated the 55th anniversary of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Artists from all over the world contributed artwork for this exhibition entitled Visions of Freedom. The exhibition of art, drawings and installations showed a range of ideas inspired by the notion of freedom. Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech makes a centerpiece for the exhibition. It's flanked by a whiteboard with the UN Declaration of Human Rights embossed in Braille.
British artist David Hockney's bold and colourful work, Celebration, is just one of the many artworks on display. Elsewhere, each of the 30 articles of the Declaration is displayed in some form. For centuries, the Tao, a traditional sailing boat, has been testimony to the enduring trade and cultural exchanges between Africa and the Orient. And more than five years ago, it became the symbol of the Zanzibar Cultural Festival. The festival was born to celebrate culture and cinema in the Dao countries. The film La Mamba is a good example. Haitian director Raoul Peck tells the story of Congo's first Prime Minister Patrice Emery Lamamba, whose life became a symbol of Africa's fight for freedom. Lamamba was assassinated in highly controversial circumstances in January 1961. Screened on the opening night of the festival, the film stole the show and unanimously won the People's Choice Award. Big films like La Mamba draw a large audience, but even this audience was no comparison to the crowds that came for the music. Including music in the festival makes sense. After all, music plays a far greater cultural role in this region than cinema does. It was in this spirit that students from the New Music Academy of the Dow Countries presented their work on stage for the first time. This festival was the launch pad for the Academy, which brought together local, Egyptian and Palestinian musicians to learn more about the roots of Tarab music. The Academy's aim is to expand the scope of the festival's activities and its role in Tanzanian cultural life. Does having blonde hair set you apart from the crowd? This exhibition at London's National Portrait Gallery presents British blondes from ancient history to Margaret Thatcher and Diana, Princess of Wales, and reaches the conclusion that blonde hair certainly makes a difference. Natural blondes make up a small percentage of most societies, yet women especially have often dyed their hair in the hope that a colour change will add something special to their life. The trend goes back to ancient myth. Aphrodite, goddess of love, was blonde. The late Princess of Wales became perhaps the most famous blonde in the world. In politics, Margaret Thatcher, as Britain's Prime Minister, stood out on the world stage.
the film industry has played a significant role in spreading the fashion for blonde hair. New techniques in the 1930s produced a new glamorous image. Joanna Pittman herself turned blonde when writing her book on blondes. It's unlikely that this fascination for blonde hair will ever go out of fashion. Does height matter in marriage? When Ved Gupta, just four feet in height, married three feet tall Puja Gupta in India's northern Kanpara city, it was just one of those rare weddings when the couples are made for each other. The 23-year-old groom is an electronics engineer, while Puja Gupta, the 21-year-old bride, is a graduate in humanities. Ved Gupta's father said he was quite happy when the marriage proposal materialised. The couple were obviously happy as their search for a suitable partner finally ended. The tradition-bound Indian society does not take kindly to people who look physically different. Most of the people who are very much below average height end up leading lonely lives. Happily for Vet and Puja Gupta, life has a different script. Anthropologists from the University of Cambridge have spent many years studying the people of the Pacific Ocean Islands of Vanuatu. This exhibition at the University Museum draws on items collected over those years as well as newly commissioned work. Ancient artifacts include a number of masks made of unfired clay and spider's webs. They're used mainly by the males of the island for ceremonial purposes. The headdresses from southern Malakula are used in age societies, so men take different grades as they progress through their lives, and there is very high status associated with those grades so the masks in particular would be restricted to men who had achieved a very high status. Fish Attraction by Michael Gusai reflects traditional art and the environment of the island, while Joseph John's Circle of Life shows features of everyday life in Vanuatu. It highlights the desire to fuse the past with the present. Anthropologists have helped the people of Vanuatu set up their own cultural centre and hope their work will be used by islanders to remember the past. And this exhibition reflects their coming of age in modern society. This museum in Mexico City had a peculiar exhibition that aimed to dispel the myth that witches flew around on brooms and encouraged people to abandon their preconceived notions about the Halloween icon. The belief that witches fly on brooms comes from the fact that long ago many witches in Europe used broomsticks to satisfy their sexual needs, spreading hallucinogenic substances on them which would make them fly. The exhibition, Strange Objects and Fantastic Creatures, was organised by Italian curators and attempts to debunk the myths about witches and wizards and show how in the past they had a social role, mainly as healers, before the influence of the church grew and they were demonised. Among the diverse objects on show are countless instruments of torture which were used to eliminate witches during the Inquisition, including a cross with a knife in the middle used to slice the body from top to bottom. Mexico is a country of enormous cultural diversity, where superstition and the supernatural are mixed with fervent and widespread Catholicism. The exhibition includes some 800 objects that belong to Italian national Alessandro Alviani, who is from a northeastern village in Italy. He began the collection by accident when he went looking for an old girlfriend who turned out to be a witch. The exhibit also includes curative and poisonous herbs, 
snakes and toads, and creatures that are a combination of other animals. In an old warehouse on the outskirts of the Cambodian capital Phnom Penh, an incessant banging and crashing can be heard almost daily as 21 art students toil to transform old rusting weapons into artworks for peace. Working almost exclusively in the unusual medium of the AK-47 rifle, the students, who three months ago had only ever sculpted in clay, have already turned out an array of metallic birds and beasts worthy of any modern art gallery. Funded in part by Oscar-winning actresses Angelina Jolie and Emma Thompson, as well as the European Union, sculptures from the Peace of Art project are eventually set to be displayed at the United Nations in New York and EU headquarters in Brussels. For most of the students, all of them from Phnom Penh's Royal University of Fine Arts, fashioning rifles, rocket launchers and heavy machine guns in forges and over anvils is an artistic dream come true. And some say bashing and heating these rusting old weapons also comes with a certain amount of risk. But most hope their work, which will be put on display in the capital, can make a small contribution in keeping the peace after Cambodia's decades-long civil war. After decades of war and upheaval, including the Khmer Rouge genocide of the 1970s, Cambodia remains awash with guns. In particular, Chinese or Russian-made AK-47 Kalashnikov rifles. The weapon wielded with deadly effect by guerrillas across the globe. But now efforts are being made to get villagers to hand in stashed weapons to be destroyed. Officials say, although there is still understandable resistance from people who have lived nearly all their lives under the shadow of conflict, the message is slowly getting through. The artists make meter-high elephants, birds and horses out of weapons handed in. Their teacher, British artist Sasha Constable, looks on with her watchful gaze. Constable, who is descended from the great 19th century landscape painter John Constable, had given her protégés a one-week crash course in the evolution of 20th century concrete art, as well as oxyacetylene welding. She said she's amazed by their creations. And as the artist's creativity flows for the students, it is also a golden chance for the project's founders and backers to promote a more peaceful, weapons-free society. With the gradual outbreak of peace in the 1990s and increased security for communities in even the most far-flung jungle-clad provinces, the need for every householder to be armed has waned. And having a weapon under one's roof is now illegal. But in the provinces, shootings, often involving blind drunk protagonists arguing over anything from a piglet to a prostitute, are an almost daily occurrence. Around 115,000 weapons have been destroyed in a series of large, very public, EU-sponsored Flames of Peace bonfires.